Good morning and welcome speakers and audience to the 30th All Energy Decarbonised webinar we've held since last May. I'm Judith Patton, project director of our duo of shows and the co-creator of All Energy way back at the start of the century. We look forward to a degree of normality later this year and have announced our 18th and 19th of August dates for the live event, the 20th in the series, at Glasgow's SEC, just weeks before COP's 26 is held there. In the meantime, webinars win the day. The call for papers on the, is on the All Energy website and closes tomorrow, which makes the live event seem just round the corner. Today, an astonishing 836 people are with us. I just wish I could see you all for Hydrogen from Hype to Reality, held in partnership with Scottish Power, a good friend of all energy and the co-located Decarbonise. First, it's time for a few housekeeping points. If you want to ask questions, then you will need to minimise your screen. Similarly, if you want to rate uh, the, the webinar. And afterwards, can I urge you to go to the All Energy website and to our forum where you will find the webinar to watch again and all the others that we've held, watched well over 18,800 times in total. And it's also where you can track down speaker presentations. This webinar will be available on demand not long after transmission, so spread the word to any colleagues who couldn't join us. Before passing over to today's chair, can I also ask that if you have any great ideas for webinar topics, and particularly if, like Scottish Power, would like to be actively involved in the planning, that you contact us. Having said that, we're taking a break for a short while so that I can get down to the serious business of planning the August conference. Now to today's session and its speakers. If you're a Guardian reader, you may have read an article yesterday about Ed Miliband's views. He urges that for the remaining eight months before COP26 is held, the focus should be on four things, one of which is the need for more immediate emissions reductions. Indeed, action now. And today's webinar title and the panelists are going to demonstrate just what they're doing now. It's always a delight to have a Scottish Power speaker or chair on a panel. Barry Carruthers is chairing and will be introducing his panelists shortly. All the biographical details are incidentally on the webinar pages on the already mentioned All Energy website. Barry is Scottish Power's Director of Hydrogen. Our paths first crossed way back in his early days of working on the on marine renewables side of things. Later, he became head of innovation, sustainability and quality. I know he is having an exciting time in his latest role and will be sharing some of that excitement with us all. Without more ado, I'd like first to wish all of you here today and your families good health. Stay safe. And then to thank Barry and his panel in advance for what I know will be a highly enjoyable and inspiring session. Over to you, Barry. Thanks very much, Judith. Uh, so yes, again, welcome uh, on behalf of all the panelists, but also Scottish Power as well. I mean, another day, uh, another exciting time to talk about hydrogen and all the aspects that go along with that. Uh, I'm sure we've got a, a massively interested audience with lots of different perspectives and therefore hopefully this panel also kind of reflects those kind of uh, different perspectives across the UK but also the market as well. And one of the things that, that's obviously happening right now is there's so much momentum and uh, such a great kind of hydrogen bubble going on right now that one, one of these times somebody's going to have to start building stuff really substantial which is certainly our, our plan at Scottish Power. So. This session really, the idea was to bring it from hype to reality. And by that we mean we've all seen enough kind of 2040, 2050 projections about what could happen. I think hopefully you'll see from some of the panelists today that there's some real projects starting to take some shape. And yes, they do have longer visions and that's going to take us on that decarbonisation journey for the decades to come. But it actually all just starts now and actually has already started. So 
we're going to get a mix of kind of what we see happening from the industrial challenge, the industrial scale, from uh, big companies, what do they need to do to try and help shape a market. We're going to see also a, a diverse range of projects across the UK, so we'll going a bit of geographical diversification. And also, when it, when it all comes down to it, we're all going to have to make some pretty chunky investment decisions this year, hopefully. And in order to do that, you do need to understand a bit of forecasting. You do need a crystal ball in the, in the back of your office or your, your team's office somewhere. So that's the kind of diverse panel that we have ahead of us. Uh, as Jude have said, uh, I'm not going to give massive introductions to everybody because they've got uh, excellent uh, uh, biographical details on, on the website and on the internet there. So uh, without further ado, we'll start off with Eugene McKenna. Uh, Eugene is Managing Director of Green Energy uh, Division at Johnson Matthey. Over to you, Eugene. Um, uh, for, for the introduction. So really good to be here today. Good morning to everyone uh, here in the UK. Um, so as Barry said, I'm Managing Director of Green Hydrogen at uh, Johnson Matthey. And um, whenever you're thinking about hype and you want a, a kind of an indication of when something has arrived at hype, my mother recognizes the fact that hydrogen's in my job title. And when my mother recognizes that, you know that it's moved beyond the discussion of the kind of techno-economic uh, business uh, community. Now, um, there's a reason for this hype, and uh, I know Barry said that we'd uh, be talking about uh, reality. I'm going to take us a little bit on that journey from hype to reality. So why the hype? Well, um, the world that we have around us today has been built, uh, is built upon the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th century, starting here uh, in the UK. And over the last 200 years, it has got involved in absolutely every aspect of uh, of our lives. The reason why we're uh, probably listening to this from um, a uh, uh, kind of uh, with a degree of wealth and well-being that we have, all of that is being enabled by uh, a fossil fuel uh, economy. As I look around the room I'm in at the moment, the top of the desk that I'm looking at, the carpet backing, the paint on the walls, they're all uh, there as a result uh, of fossil fuels and the journey that we have in front of us is to stop all of that by 2050 after there's been 150 years of fossil fuels uh, ingraining themselves in absolutely everything that we do. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that when going on this journey nobody uh, as the phrase goes has uh, voted to be poorer. Um, we want the, the Western developed uh, economies to continue uh, developing uh, kind of wealth and well-being. And we don't want to slow down that journey for developing nations as they come to share in the benefits uh, of wealth and health. However, it's all got to be done without going through that carbon emitting journey that uh, the developed nations have already gone on. Now, looking at the slide uh, that I put up at the moment um, is uh, a kind of an illustration of the challenge that's in front of us. Um, at the, so hydrogen, we intend, will be uh, an important part of the energy mix as we get towards uh, 2050. There are different opinions on how much, but taking this view from uh, the Hydrogen Council. At the moment, uh, we produce about 2,600 terawatt hours a year of hydrogen. It uh, goes into applications like cleaning fuels. Uh, and uh, all of that hydrogen at the moment is uh, used for uh, processes like uh, uh, chemical applications and, and, and cleaning fuels, and all of it is dirty. Absolutely none of that hydrogen is any use for the hydrogen economy of the future. It emits a lot of carbon dioxide, as much as the UK and Indonesia combined. So to put this in context, by 2050, we need an order of magnitude 10 times as much hydrogen, and it all has to be clean. So that gives you a bit of background as to why we've got some hype around this, because that implies a huge amount of uh, investment, a huge amount of infrastructure, a huge amount of technological development. So going to move a little bit further on that journey from hype to reality now. So as we go to on that journey, we've got to produce hydrogen and it's got to be clean. And there are two types of clean hydrogen blue hydrogen that's made from uh, steam methane reforming, but where we capture the carbon dioxide, and green hydrogen, uh, which comes from water electrolysis with renewable uh, energy, uh, which never involves carbon in the first place, at least in its generation. So we need to do that. And then we need applications as well. So that hydrogen needs to displace uh, fossil fuels in applications such as transportation, 
in uh, the uh, decarbonizing uh, the use, uh, uh, energy use and power generation in industry, in uh, buildings, heat and power. And that final one is one that's often overlooked as a clean feedstock for industry, because at the moment, the feedstocks for petrochemicals, as the name suggests, are fossil fuels. And we've got to do that uh, by providing the energy from renewable sources. Hydrogen's a, a great building block to, to substitute out fossil fuels. Not to forget in the middle, um, we've got to get the hydrogen from where it's being made to where it's being used. So there has to be a whole midstream, uh, which could be local. It could be the whole way from Australia to the UK, for example, all the way around the world. We need a midstream for transportation and for storage. And finally, that's all got to happen at the same time. No point in producing it if you haven't got a market. You can't develop a market unless you've got a product to put into it. So it's as simple as that. So a little bit of hype, a little bit of reality. You don't get long talking in a business discussion before we start talking about cost. Um, so to try and illustrate the cost challenge in front of us here, I've taken our three types of hydrogen. Gray, representing today's fossil fuel world where we just make hydrogen and emit the carbon dioxide. And then our two clean types of hydrogen, uh, green and blue. Gray at the moment is cheap due to the wonderful efficiency of the process that makes it and the fact that uh, currently people emit carbon dioxide without any penalty. That's one to two dollars a kilo. Blue is a little bit more expensive because we've got to capture that carbon dioxide. So that'll start off a little more expensive and it will get cheaper as we get mass deployment of carbon capture and storage and get better and better at it. Green which people are very keen on because it doesn't involve any uh, carbon in the first place. It's the splitting of uh, water, H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. Starts off much more expensive and then has to go on an incredible technological journey over the next 30 years where we take out 80% of the cost. A lot of that's technological improvement. Another portion of it is economies of scale and getting better at uh, manufacturing. And finally, grey. Um, needs a little bit of stick as well. So it shouldn't be possible to just emit that carbon dioxide with no penalty. And carbon taxes will gradually make gray, and gray more and more expensive. And so it will naturally become an economic choice to choose green and blue eventually rather than gray. So all of the way down then in our journey from uh, hype uh, to uh, reality, I want to get us in touch with uh, real projects happening in the real world. And, uh, you know, what, I, I, to kind of throw out a few more well-trodden phrases, the, um, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And this kind of illustrates this, because here's some real projects, the first couple of steps on that journey, which are the most important steps from where we look at the moment of real projects happening right here, right now. The first one here is a, um, a blue hydrogen project happening here in the UK. It's the HiNet project, uh, which uh, involves a, a number of partners. It's got Johnson Matthey technology in it, but it's also got progressive energy driving the project to an SR refinery with carbon capture and storage in an, in an ENI a depleted gas field. And this will produce 80,000 tonnes of hydrogen a year in the northwest of England, uh, which is a lot of hydrogen. It's equivalent to a world scale hydrogen plant. So, no messing about. This is not pilot scale, this is world scale hydrogen production. And that hydrogen will go out into hard to decarbonize applications like industry, uh, into homes, and uh, into transport. Um, the second project, uh, which is uh, just being announced, is a project in Patagonia in Chile, the Haru Oni project. It's uh, once again got Johnson Matthey uh, technology involved, but it's uh, it's driven by Siemens Energy, and that project really goes the the full breadth. So it goes from offshore wind to green hydrogen to use that as a feedstock to manufacture uh, clean fuels. In this case, methanol and gasoline. And uh, so once again, a real project at the start that will be 900 liters a year from next year. But over three phases by 2026, that will get to 550 million litres a year, which is material. And that's enough, for example, for uh, more than 200,000 uh, gasoline vehicles. So I hope I've kind of illustrated uh, what, why there's hype, the kind of enormity and excitement that we have in this journey, the importance of the first steps, and the fact that we're already taking those first steps with, with first projects. So with that, I'll, I'll hand back to Barry. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Eugene. I mean, firstly, actually, apologies for a small technical problem. I think I don't think all the audience could see your slides, but I should say all the slides are going to be available afterwards anyway. So you'll be able to see uh, some of the details that Eugene was talking about, but just proper projects, proper scale, as you said, you know, right at the thick end of delivery and trying to make a real, a real kind of impact into decarbonisation. So brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Uh, secondly, uh, a real kind of hydrogen and certainly regional champion coming along, uh, John Aldi, who's the uh, Strategic Business Development Manager at uh, Cromarty Firth Ports. Absolutely brilliant, enthusiastic speaker. So high expectations for this. Joanne, I know you've got a lot to talk us, to us about, uh, certainly in the region. There's so much going on. Uh, so over to you. Thanks very much. No pressure at all. <laughs> much appreciated. Um, and hello to everyone, wherever you're watching, whenever you're watching. I'm conscious some of you may not be watching live, so I genuinely hope you find this uh, of interest. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the North of Scotland Hydrogen Programme and our ambitions at um, Port of Cromarty Firth and the broader Cromarty Firth region. And um, the reason we are so excited is we are in the heart of the offshore wind development region um, identified in the, the marine plan and the, the Scott wind leasing sites in particular that have been identified for offshore wind development. So we're looking at a, a 50 year pipeline of multi-billion pound offshore wind construction projects right on our doorstep. Uh, if you imagine Aberdeen in the 1970s before the oil and gas rush, that is the Cromarty Firth right now, um, but ahead of a re renewable energy gold rush instead. Um, and we're, as I say, right at the heart of it. The Cromarty Firth has the best facilities for accommodating the large work scopes to build these projects out. So we've got the proven facilities, we have the track record, we've supported more offshore wind projects than any other ports in Scotland, and we have the supply chains, we have the expertise and the businesses able to support these projects. Where we have a bit of a hiccup is we have major grid constraints in the Highlands. There, are, there is so much renewable energy being produced in our region, that there are more people putting into the grid than taking out, which makes it very expensive for developers to connect to the grid. And that is what started us looking at hydrogen. And we, uh, as, uh, as Eugene was saying, we went out and started looking for the market first. Um, there's lots of people doing hydrogen projects. We didn't just want to do a hydrogen project for the sake of it. We don't have the time for that. Uh, so we went out to market and to find out whether there were people who wanted to take the hydrogen to decarbonize their activities. And we found a number of industries that were already ready to be taking hydrogen, um, some from as early as 2022, 2023. Um, in fact, we were faced with a challenge of some of the Scotland projects are not likely to be built out until around 2026 and beyond, but we have industry wanting hydrogen ahead of that time. So we had to try and find a way to, 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 uh, to match the two. Uh, and we have a, a couple of, of options that we're already looking at, but uh, we just went out last July. So we're babies in the hydrogen sector really, but the momentum that we've picked up since just last year has been incredible. We've identified demand in the region of tens of tonnes per day for green hydrogen. Our project will be green hydrogen from the outset. And as I say, from as early as 2023, 2024, uh, so that's across industrial use, aviation, the council fleets uh, for their cars and vans. Uh, we're also strategically at the end of the gas grid. They're looking to do a 20% blend of hydrogen into the grid from around 2025, 26. Um, we have uh, trains as well due to decarbonise those north and east of Inverness and, and this region are likely to use hydrogen to do that. It's not likely to be electrified in those regions. And we know the gas grid will go to 100% hydrogen from around 2030 to 2035. So that's just what we have in our region. And um, we also have major export potential with interest, particularly from Northern Europe. And I'm conscious that the, the title obviously is from hype to reality. So what we're doing today uh, we're in the middle of a feasibility study involving Scottish Power and Barry has been a, a, a tremendous supporter and, and very highly valued supporter of this project. 
We're also working with three major distillery brands, uh, Glenmorran, G, White and Mackay and Diageo. And fortunate to have Pale Blue Dot leading the study. Uh, obviously, they have significant experience in hydrogen. Um, and the study is being privately funded by the partners. And the aim is to explore the feasibility of a large scale electrolysis facility in the Firth producing green hydrogen from either onshore or offshore wind and um, producing it competitively for local and export use. So we're, we're really looking at the production, storage and distribution elements uh, to make sure that we can do that competitively. And the distillers being highly credible, high users, non-seasonal users, uh, multinational brands obviously able to sign up to multi-year contracts we believe that they'll probably be our first off takers from our um from our electrolysis facility so that'll give it a really good kickstart and we can build the other projects on the back of that um, the feasibility study is due to complete in june and then we'll move hopefully to an engineering and design phase and all being well um an early phase project after that so we are quite ambitious that, that this will be um, one of the uh, the next scale of hydrogen projects in in Scotland we're expecting it to be quite large scale um, from it from the outset and just to finish on a, a couple of uh, complementary projects that we're working on um, we are part funding a study with ERM and the oil and gas technology center into the bulk marine transport of hydrogen again looking at that export piece studying the different hydrogen carriers and looking at standardization where possible so that we can achieve economies of scale. We're working with a consortium called Opportunity Cromarty Firth to bid to become a green port. Uh, hopefully after the election when that competition opens, we believe the benefits for hydrogen um, specifically around the capex reliefs um, for setting up a new, dis a new electrolysis facility could be significant and, and could make sure that we see this in Scotland. And then finally, we are pulling together the Powerhouse, which is a new applied research and development and education centre. And um, so this will focus on floating offshore wind and green hydrogen technologies. And we want that to become a global centre of excellence, really to position Scotland as world leaders in these technologies. And um, so we're working with a number of, uh, of university partners and, uh, and we're just bringing in industry partners at this stage, very much want it to be a collaboration between the two. And it will be hosted by the University of the Highlands and Islands in the Cromarty Firth at their campus in Olness. So actively seeking academic and industry partners for that across Europe, if anybody is interested. And uh, I will leave it there. I'm conscious there's so much positive stories to get through and share with you and uh, welcome questions uh, at, uh, at a later point. Thanks, Joanna. I'm sure you will get questions because it's such a, a rich kind of project. I mean, you get wind, water and whiskey. What, what, is, is there a more Scottish project that ever has been conceived? So, Brilliant example of hype to reality because you're right, real stuff, real distillery project now, deliverable now, but actually having that scalability, the build out for hundreds of megawatts into gigawatts right into offshore wind. Brilliant. Thank you very much for covering that. So if that's the kind of north of Scotland, uh, in the Cromarty region, we're going to take you on a wee uh, journey uh, down the east coast to Hydrogen East. And we have Jonathan Reynolds, who's the co-founder and director of Hydrogen East. Over to you, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Barry. And morning, everybody. Uh, so, I'm, as I said, I'm Jonathan Reynolds, uh, co-founder and director of Hydrogen East, uh, established at the same time as uh, as, uh, as Joanne, really, it's sort of July uh, 2020, we launched uh, Hydrogen East, co-founded uh, with Nigel Cornwall, who's also a, a key figure uh, in the world of energy and utility markets. But we, we quickly established ourselves as an independent and impartial research-led body championing cleaner hydrogen technologies, but both supply and demand sectors. And we've built a strong analytical team already that uh, underpinnings a lot of our research activities. And we're already launching a number of significant concepts and projects uh, that we're actively developing with, with a range of partners. Um, this is why. So we, we see East Anglia as a rich energy region already, internationally connected gas terminals, around about 50% of the existing operational fleet of UK offshore wind and a lot more to come. 
we have nuclear at Sizewell, potentially at Bradwell uh, as well, further downstream uh, in, in, in the next few years. Significant solar capacity, all the little yellow dots on the map there are actually solar farms uh, across Norfolk, Suffolk and North Essex there. And huge potential for, for hydrogen uh, when we start to connect the dots. What we don't have though is large industrial loads similar to many other industrial clusters in other regions that are also developing uh, hydrogen plants. But we have identified some major potential energy hubs, so flexible energy hubs to blend gas, nuclear, wind, solar with hydrogen, both looking at blue, enabled, enabled by CCUS, but also uh, rapidly looking towards green and, uh, and decarbonizing the whole energy system. So just a quick run through some of our, our projects, the, and these are you know, not hype, these are absolutely moving towards reality. So similar uh, kind of scoping studies are underway. Uh, our own will, will deliver in uh, next month at the end of April. But we're looking at the Bacton Terminal. So you can see the picture there is, is, is the Bacton Terminal on North Norfolk's coast, uh, handling around about 30% of UK's domestic gas needs. And we have the, obviously the, the Southern North Sea, so uh, the UK's gas capital. We have two significant interconnectors, I should say, one to Belgium, one to Netherlands, which we could start looking at large scale import and export of hydrogen between between us, uh, between the continent and ourselves. This is a joint study that we're kicking off where we're leading, uh, funded by OGTC, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, the New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership and North Norfolk District Council. Again, the local authority uh, sees huge opportunity for decarbonizing the district, but also looking at re regional opportunities, not just some of the big national infrastructure opportunities that, that Bacton currently delivers against. Um, so the report's due to be completed uh, by the end of next month, uh, and we'll be sharing the learning and the options in developing a regional but internationally connected hydrogen economy. We're also working very closely with uh, Sizewell C, EDF Energy, and a range of other partners in looking at the development of innovative clean energy hubs. I kind of mentioned that uh, briefly, but the energy hub concept for Sizewell is significant. Uh, many of you will be aware of the plans for Sizewell C, a, you know, a significant new build nuclear project producing about 3.2 gigawatts of, of low carbon electricity once fully constructed. What we don't often talk about is the amount of heat, low carbon heat, uh, that nuclear also produces. So for 3.2 gigawatts of power, actually Sizewell C could be producing up to eight gigawatts of low carbon heat. When we start to look at low carbon heat and power to support uh, a high temperature electrolysis, actually we can look at the efficiency for certain technologies producing even more hydrogen. But that's just one component of a much more integrated energy hub, looking at hydrogen, battery storage, thermal storage, and a, a sort of flexibility across gas networks, transport uses, power networks, and other heat networks. So really interesting development. Um, Sizewell C is storming ahead with development of a two megawatt demonstration project likely to be powered by Sizewell B, the existing nuclear power station, and, and looking at a, a range of potential opportunities for decarbonizing the actual construction of Sizewell C itself through allowing you know, the, the demonstrator to support hydrogen uh, HGVs, construction vehicles, and, and, and other systems as well. Moving on, the one that was announced in the Chancellor's budget earlier this month, and that's the Freeport East. Uh, so Freeport East, one of uh, the eight Freeports that's been announced uh, by, by Rishi Sunak. Uh, and this covers the Port of Felix, though, and the Port of Harwich, so Suffolk and Essex uh, borders. Um, and looking at including a large scale hydrogen hub, which could deliver around about one gigawatt uh, of hydrogen, or at least 20 percent. Uh, of, the, of the government's current plans or targets for, for 2030. And you can see a range of partners. So the Freeport is very much spearheaded by the Port of Felixstowe and Harwich International Port. But around hydrogen, we have EDF, we have Sizewell C, Rice Hydrogen, Wright Bus, JCB, and hopefully others that uh, are on this call will be joining uh, that, that uh, consortium uh, very soon to really start getting under the skin of how do we make this real? How do we look at the integration of nuclear, of offshore wind? How do we assess the priority markets around trains, HGVs, the, you know, the, the, the sheer volume uh, of containerized traffic coming through the Port of Felix, though, it is the UK's largest container terminal after all, uh, so huge potential. And we've also identified uh, potential pipeline routes uh, along the high pressure, intermediate pressure, existing gas network that could connect Bacton directly to the Port of Felix, though. Again, so connecting two major, major hydrogen hubs. Um, they're the, the, the developments we're looking at at scale, but actually you know, these are 
two significant hubs of what could be a much more integrated network. What we're actually doing now is, is also looking at the smaller local energy hub concept. So we have a number of, of enterprise parts, business parts across our region, across Norfolk and Suffolk in particular, that actually have on-site renewables. So the two graphics there, the one on the right is a solar farm, the Scotto Enterprise Park in North Norfolk, 50 megawatt solar farm and a former RAF base with a high pressure gas ring main actually could be used or potentially used for, for test and demonstration purposes. The turbine picture there is Nest Point. Uh, the turbine is actually called Gulliver. Uh, it's one of the, the biggest turbines uh, onshore in, in England. It's actually an offshore prototype. Um, right underneath it is the Orbis Energy Center. So anybody in offshore wind will, will know uh, Orbis Energy very well uh, at Brisbane and Easterly Point. We're actually developing a gas flex gen battery storage, onshore wind, possibly solar, hydrogen electrolyzer, desalination kind of combo. Um, very happy to share much more information. We're, we should, we're being very open about that, that project, uh, but offering huge opportunity for stimulating local development, stimulating local uh, you know, projects uh, to kickstart both supply and demand. Uh, and lastly, we're, we're very involved in looking at how we stimulate vehicle demand, certainly for the transport uh, sector, which we feel is one of the bigger priority opportunities. And this is a key differentiator for Hydro Nice, balancing supply and demand. Uh, and we're actually lo looking at the roles of local authorities, local government bodies, in helping to aggregate demand across public buses, public transport, across their waste refuse fleets, gritters, you know, other, other heavy goods vehicles, etc., to help stimulate both local demand and local refueling infrastructure where possible and help to unlock the wider commercial opportunity. So that's a, a quick canter through some of Hydro Nice's early project developments. So hopefully you can see we're turning words into action, but hopefully turning hype into reality. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I had so much to cover again in, in such a region like that. And of course, a, an area we're familiar with ourselves because East Anglia won, but also our future developments in East Anglia hub for offshore wind. And uh, really look forward to picking up a few of those things with you in the next couple of weeks, uh, as we've talked about. So that's, uh, I guess we've gone from Cromarty North, we've gone to East with Jonathan. Uh, we'll, start, we'll keep heading South uh, for, <laughs> for the springtime, try and catch some sun. So uh, we're going to move to Abigail Dombey who is the chair of Hydrogen Sussex. And of course, that takes us along the south coast and all the exciting things happening there. So over to you, Abigail. Hi, well, greetings from the south of England. Um, delighted to be here this morning. Like the others, we were established in July 2020. I'm not sure what was going on then. That created such a flurry of activity in, across the hydrogen sector in the UK, but um, it was um, definitely an important time for us. As we all know, um, we're compelled to move at an unprecedented pace to deliver the innovation, investment, regulation and market environment that will enable the required step change towards net zero. And our vision for Sussex is to become a leading hyd hydrogen region in hydrogen production and the development and uptake of hydrogen vehicles. We're working to establish the innovation, skills and supply chain that will underpin our energy transition. And hydrogen is not just an en an energy and emissions reduction opportunity, it could also have an important role generating new economic opportunities in the region. So our unique selling points are our natural resources, infrastructure, skilled engineering workforce, workforce and our partnership. So Hydrogen Sussex is a unique pub private public sector coalition which came out of work on the Greater Brighton Energy, um, energy Plan. We have a range of members across the public, public sector and private industry, including international engineering companies, transport organisations, universities and utility companies. So that, that may sound like the hype. What's the reality? So the reality is um, we're currently, our partners are currently working on Shoreham Green Hydrogen Hub, which is a partnership between Shoreham Port and H2 Evolution, who are the developer. Um, so they're working on a 20 megawatt um, electrolyzer which will produce 340 kil kilograms of um, an hour of high purity green hydrogen from renewable energy they've already got substantial embedded renewable generation at the port including wind solar and wave power so this 340 kilograms an hour of hydrogen will allow um, 300 buses a day to be um, decarbonized, which will reduce emissions by 115 tonnes of carbon a day. And obviously this will be a huge enabler for local authority decarbonation, decarbonisation plans, improving air quality, which is absolutely key for ultra low emission zones. 
at the moment they're in um they're about to submit their planning application next month and um, the plans are to commence commercial operation in summer 24. we're also lucky enough to have ricardo within our area um, ricardo is a leading global engineering and environmental consultancy um, their work spans a wide range of sectors including automotive commercial in vehicle off-highway and industry personal transport aerospace, defence, marine, rail and energy. Earlier this year, Ricardo announced a £2.5 million investment to build a hydrogen development and test facility at its Shoreham Technical Centre, which is within within Sussex. Um, so they and they, com they, they foresee a huge amount of their um, future work to be in and around hydrogen. We've also got um, Brighton Hove Buses, Metrobus, who have an ambitious vision to turn their regional bus fleet of almost 400 buses to zero emission by 2030. The first phase is a deployment at Metro, buses Craw at Metro Bus Crawley in West Sussex, where initially 22 new fastway buses will take to the streets in just over a year's time, operating 24 hours a day. So this will be a serious um, a test of the new hydrogen fuel cell technology. A further phased rollout in Crawley will see a total of a third of their buses operating from the Crawley depot switched to zero emissions. And this project has been made possible with European funding as well as UK government investment and contribution from Gatwick Airport as the fastway buses serve Gatwick Airport. The proposed second phase of the de deployment, which is not yet fully agreed, but, re but includes really encouraging partnership work going on with U New Haven with the town deal funding. The phase deployment looks like a hydrogen refueling hub funded by the by um, the town jail funding. Um, and um, Brighton Hope Bus is currently looking for funding to turn 50 bus the, the 50 bus fleet into hydrogen fuel cell, which would make it the first all hydrogen bus depot in the world if no one else gets there first. Crucially, the refueling infrastructure would also be shared with Lewis New Haven councils. So three so three fleets of vehicles would be able to use the hydrogen refueling infrastructure which basically allows um, brighton hope buses big buying power to substantially reduce the cost of entry for the two councils it would also deliver air quality improvements across three air quality management areas so um, overall hydrogen sussex is an ecosystem for green growth as you've heard including renewable energy supply um, green hydrogen production, hydrogen supply, infrastructure, zero emission buses. Um, and working in, in partnership with Ricardo and academic partners, we can also deliver technology development, Ricardo's, including Ricardo's Hydrogen Transport Centre of Excellence, and working on vehicle conversions. And overall, obviously, this will deliver as well as um, reductions in carbon emissions, but significant improvements in air quality and deliver real jobs as well um, to the region. So that's all from me for the moment. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much. Again, great to see such uh, leadership from public sector there. And, uh, you know, like we've seen in other areas, uh, even public sector making these kind of transition with their, with their own fleet choices, then perhaps unlock other cluster effects in there as well. So brilliant to see that happen down Sussex as well. So. Okay, so hopefully you've heard so from three really exciting clusters that have emerged uh, from north to south. But to, to bring these projects to reality, we're all going to have to make, as I said at the start, some pretty chunky investment decisions uh, sometime soon. And in order to do that, you do want to have a view of the future, not because of hype, but so you've got an informed investment decision. So we really do need some kind of clever forecasting and analysis. And that, that means we can turn now to Simon Ellis who's a uh, head of global gas analysis, ICIS. Uh, over to you, Simon, to talk to talk us through your kind of crystal ball forecasting. Well, thanks very much, Barry, and uh, good morning, everyone. So what I want to do uh, particularly today is to, as we hydrogen moves from hype to reality, uh, we need to start really talking about costs and talking about price transparency. Uh, and really what I want to talk about is just a, a looking at how hydrogen could, could become a, a traded commodity. Uh, but first, I just wanted to introduce uh, ICIS as a company, as, as many of you may not be familiar with us. So uh, we have a 150-year uh, history of analyzing uh, and uh, 
uh, reporting on the prices of, of different commodities. Uh, I noticed Eugene mentioned uh, mentioned paint. That was one of the first ones we, we covered 150 years ago. But now the commodities that we, we cover include uh, energy, uh, energies like uh, gas, power, and uh, and carbon. And uh, in many of those commodities, we we uh, actually the industry relies on the pricing that we can uh, that we deliver. And I wanted to talk briefly about how that kind of price benchmarking, that price reporting role. Can, can play a role in really supporting uh, the, uh, the development of industries like hydrogen. So what I wanted to do is just because commoditization can be a little bit abstract, I wanted to give a, a real world example about uh, commoditization in the European gas market. So uh, just the, uh, what I really want to talk about is just at the start um, of the uh, sort of liberalization of the gas market in Europe that was pioneered in, in the UK. Um, and uh, that process started with the opening up of sort of pipeline uh, infrastructure. But at the start of that process, uh, the market wasn't very efficient. Prices were, were very uh, opaque. Um, only a few kind of entrants to that market and new entrants found it difficult to get in, get into that market uh, because of that uh, lack of transparency. So in the, uh, the mid 90s, uh, Heron Energy, which is now part of uh, ICIS uh, started effectively pricing those gas trades. Um, I noticed Jonathan mentioned the, the Bacton hub. Um, one of the, uh, that was a physical entry point for, for UK gas. That was one of the first uh, you know, points that, was, that we started to assess. Uh, but one of the big changes that drove liquidity in the UK gas market was the, uh, the creation of a virtual hub, which actually linked all of the physical in entry points together. And uh, when my, uh, uh, predecessors effectively were trying to get prices. They would just literally phone up the uh, the traders in that market, uh, and then kind of print the prices for that day. And gradually, that process allowed uh, there to be a transparent price for 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 UK gas. Um, and then, ultimately, what happened was that when the uh, physical infrastructure arrived to connect the UK to continental Europe. Uh, what had happened in a continent with gas pricing, it, as a lot of commodities which, which don't have an established price, um, it, it had just linked to the price of the commodity that it replaced, namely fuel oil and gas oil. But because this uh, transparent pricing was was uh, had taken place in the UK, uh, more and more European countries started launching gas hubs, and we started pricing those those gas hubs uh, along with others. And eventually, you ended up in a situation where there was transparency, not about, not just about prices now, but uh, because of the role of, of exchanges and forward contracts, you could see what prices were doing into the future, uh, which meant that we had one of the most sort of efficient gas markets in the UK. Now, just turning to the uh, role of uh, the prospects for, for hydrogen, well, the existing grey fossil fuel hydrogen market, at the moment, there is no real price to link to. There's no accepted price benchmark. And one of the reasons is because hydrogen isn't transported very far. It's often consumed on site. Um, it's often consumed by a single uh, uh, you know, consumer. And it is difficult to transport long distance. So that's one of the reasons why there's no real price to, to use. But I mean, one of the questions here as well is, is why worry too much about pricing at this point? Because we're moving into a, as we move into the clean hydrogen market or low carbon hydrogen market. Well, one of the reasons for that is because, I mean, obviously there's a lot of support and rightly so for the development of that market now. Um, and most uh, uh, projects are trying to sign contracts of five to 10 years um, and are receiving a say support and ideas for further support through things like carbon contracts for difference and uh, and guarantees for origin offering a new uh, uh, revenue stream but at, at some point that subsidy those subsidy mechanisms are going to start to be to be withdrawn and i think we'll need to have some clarity about how to sell additional volumes flexible uh, volumes of hydrogen which are produced in excess of, of contract quantities as well and also have some certainty to get financing for projects as we move forward and in the EU, um, the Commission has called for a euro-denominated benchmark, uh, benchmark price for hydrogen to spur the development of the market. So the problem now, though, is how do we try and make price assessments for uh, clean hydrogen, blue and green hydrogen, uh, when there's very little actually 
uh, moved around at the moment, very little actually produced. Well, one of the things we can do to give an indicator for that is to look at cost-based pricing. Now, I mentioned that gas prices in Europe were originally uh, indexed to the commodities that they replaced. Uh, and, and that could also happen for blue and green hydrogen. Uh, the biggest component to blue hydrogen, which is more straightforward to price, is the, uh, it would be the price of the MVP UK gas, which is the, the feedstock for, for producing it. Um, and the infrastructure is quite standardized, quite established, so it should be fairly easy to produce a, a number to give an indication of what that would, that would cost. Um, for green, it's, it's trickier because uh, you don't necessarily buy electricity, as we've heard from the previous speakers, from the grid. Um, so each project might have its own economics. It, it might be uh, much more difficult to come up with a transparent pricing mechanism or cost-based pricing mechanism for green hydrogen. And just to, uh, to, to finish off the uh, very short discussion on, uh, on pricing, just to look ahead to the future. Um, just in theory, this is how hydrogen could move from what, where it is now, uh, a, a commodity which is being very much kind of supported um, by different mechanisms to a, a traded commodity competing on price with other decarbonized forms of electricity. So we could move from those um, indicators based on the, uh, the cost of production. Um, and as we, the physical infrastructure grows, um, as we connect some of those hubs, such as the ones that Jonathan was potentially talking about in the east of England together, we can get more and more liquidity, um, the ability to assess um, you know, locally. But then as, as the national network potentially builds up, we have a chance to then kind of collect that liquidity together um, to get more pricing information, which again gives that, that spur to uh, further investment in the market. And eventually we can look forward to uh, the potential international shipping and pipeline transportation of, of hydrogen as well, which will allow international arbitrage. Um, and at the same time, just on the right, very briefly, I've shown some of the uh, uh, potential uh, end game in terms of uh, financialization of, of, of the commodity. Um, Again, the, the end game here is really to be able to have transparent pricing, allowing uh, stakeholders like government, but also customers to know that they that, that the commodity that hydrogen can compete on cost. So at that point, I'll, I'll hand back to Barry and uh, and hopefully we can take your questions. It's really, really good to have that long term view. We, we all know that's kind of where we want to get to. This is going to be decades and decades of a, of a market that's emerging. So we might need to make, you know, big investment decisions now to get projects going and make right good business cases. But of course, all the things that take us right the way back to kind of Eugene talked, uh, talked about at the very start of the session is about laying that groundwork for the decades to come, trying to have a view as to where things are going. So brilliant analysis. Thank you very much, Simon. Okay, uh, that's been a, hopefully uh, for everybody, that's been really exciting to see all the different projects across the UK, different perspectives from industry, from forecasting. Uh, now is the time for questions. So we've got about, if I remember correctly, about half an hour for questions. Uh, we've got loads of questions coming in. We'll come back to the panel on, on your screens, hopefully. So we've got a few questions uh, identified already. Please keep firing them in because as, as the panelists are answering these ones, uh, we'll, we'll shape up what the next ones are. So if I can very rudely look off to the side here to remind myself the key questions that have been picked out already. So we're going to go, we're going to start with technology, not something we've talked about to a great degree so far, but as we all know, is absolutely fundamental to the economics, the performance and how this actually delivers benefits in the end. So if we think about uh, hydrogen uh, production and the conversion losses. So let's take the, the green hydrogen example. You've got renewable electricity already. Are there better uses for that electricity as is before you start converting it and have conversion losses into hydrogen? Uh, then of course the actual electrolyzers themselves, what kind of innovations need to happen there to get the kind of dramatic cost reductions and, and innovation steps that, that certainly Eugene mentioned at the very start, again, to give us that trajectory like Simon's talked about, to get the cost down over time. So in that technology space, uh, I guess if we could come to uh, Abigail and Eugene primarily, uh, and everybody else is obviously very welcome to comment, but I guess, Eugene, uh, your, your first thoughts on, I know you've talked a, a wee bit in the past about electrolyzer innovations, things like that. Any thoughts on the technology side? 
on uh, on the advances in the technology side? Sure. Um, so I think um, there's a great desire to have lots more uh, green hydrogen, and, and I think it it appeals to people because it's a great technology and a great source of, of hydrogen that we can we can uh, use in, in ways to decarbonize uh, the energy infrastructure. I think it also appeals to people's uh, in in its sense of a desire to move away from fossil fuels uh, because uh, fossil fuels aren't ostensibly involved in the manufacture of the, the hydrogen uh, to, to begin with. Um, we can kind of come back to the fact that it's not as clear cut as that whenever you look at the life cycle analysis. But if we look at the, the uh, green hydrogen as it moves forward, uh, there are uh, two real big drivers for reducing the cost. The first one's kind of pragmatic with any new piece of equipment. If this was, um, you know, making washing machines or uh, making new cars, as we go into mass production, there's huge opportunities for economies of scale, mass production, as people learn how to make these things uh, better and the, as they might go up, what materials to make them from. Technological advances in the whole system but uh, one area where the real exciting things are uh, happening is uh, at the heart of the electrolyzer. People may be aware that there are a variety of electrolyzer technologies out there. The one that us, we and Johnson Matthew are particularly interested in is PEM electrolysis, proton exchange membrane electrolysis, uh, not least of all because it involves uh, platinum group metal catalysts on each side of a membrane. And really, the exciting technology happens in that unit at the heart of the uh, electrolyzer, that catalyst coated membrane at the heart of the electrolyzer. And as we look forward over the next 10 to 15 years, if you imagine a, uh, an electrolyzer unit, which could at the start look like, uh, you know, full copying machine size for a small application or more likely the size of a, an articulated lorry container or a container off the back of uh, a ship, hopefully not stuck in the Suez Canal, but the, uh, kind of one of those containers off a, of a ship. And um, as we move forward, you put electricity in one side of that container and you get hydrogen out the other side. And over the next 10 years, we'll be able to put in 10 times as much electricity in one end of that container and get 10 times more hydrogen out the other side. And all of that will be because of improvements on the technology on the catalyst coated membrane. So that's where the real exciting um, chemistry and physics is happening at the moment, which, uh, which we're involved in. Clearly that will drive down the cost because uh, the less boxes you need to produce the hydrogen, the, uh, the more capital efficient the whole thing will become. The lower the footprint of a green hydrogen site will become as well as that, as that technology moves forward. Yeah, fascinating, absolutely fascinating stuff. Thank you, Abigail. I guess the the other point of the of the question that came in was more about conversion losses and electrification, and when to use electrification, and what do we do about these conversion losses? Because we do need to go from uh, electricity to hydrogen. Uh, what's your What's your thoughts about what we can do around those conversion losses and when we are not to use it? Oh, well, I think you. I think you've done the classic. You need, you need that <laughs> Someone had to do that today. Um, I've actually got a slide that sums it up, but I don't know whether it's possible to share it or not. Um, oh, there we go. So um, batteries work really well with small vehicles, but for heavy duty trucks and buses that have high power demands and extensive use of usage patterns, um, di direct electrification using batteries is much more challenging due to the size and weight of the batteries required. I think I heard that for a um, for an electric train running on batteries, it would require 32, 33 tons worth of batteries. So heavy vehicles require massive batteries, over 800 kilowatts for an HGV for a driving range of over 300 miles. And charging such batteries, even with a fast charger, takes several hours. So fuel cells have huge competitive ad advantages for these vehicles. And the other thing to note is that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles can be re refueled in minutes which is the same time as for a petrol or diesel vehicle. Whereas um, at the moment to refuel an electric car or an electric heavy vehicle would take literally hours. So, um, and to follow on the earlier point about electrolyzers, there are, there are already a huge, there's a huge amount of progress in the field of electrolyzers, um, super critical solutions, which are, uh, based in the, in the south of England, um, they're developing a highly efficient electrolyzer for hydrogen production with their solution requiring 20% less energy to produce hydrogen than standard electrolyzers and doesn't require a compressor. 
and they can use waste heat to further reduce energy demands. So there's there's a huge amount of there's a huge amount going on and huge potential. And I think um, it reminds me of a tweet that Chris Dark, the chief exec of um, the Commission for Climate. Um, I can never remember the, the title, um, the Climate Change Commission um, said, he said, I see we're back to debating hydrogen versus electrification again. Here's a secret from our big fancy net zero computer model. We need lots of both, which is so it's, um, that's one thing we need to remember is it's and not all. Yeah, no, a great message to leave it on because we kind of, I mean, certainly again, selfishly from Scottish Power's point of view, we, we've shouted for a while now about electrifying the hell out of everything. And that 80, 90 percent of decarbonisation, absolutely electrification is the right thing. But hydrogen is one of those elements that now allows you to tackle the 10, 20 percent that's difficult. And some of the some of the kind of business cases you've outlined there are really, really useful. It, OK, switching subject a wee bit uh, to gas pipelines. So it's been mentioned a few times today, whether it's back to terminal or, or projects being somewhere connected to the gas grid. The question really is, are the, are the gas networks, are the pipelines ready for this? Do they need substantial investment to make them ready? Where, where are we? Is that, is that a viable use of hydrogen right now? Uh, I'm going to come to Jonathan first and then a bit of warning. I'm going to come to you, Joanne, after this to see if you have any thoughts on it as well. Jonathan, any thoughts on, on the readiness of gas pipelines? Yeah, lots of thoughts. Um, I, I guess the question is, you know, the, well, it's going to be pipe uh, pipeline dependence. I think every individual pipeline is going to need to have a level of assessment done. Um, we've got an aging network onshore and offshore. Uh, and there's a very big question actually around production methods that I think we still need to, you just need to look at. Are we actually going to be transporting hydrogen via some of the offshore pipe networks? Or are we going to, or processing it, say, at a terminal, such as Bacton or Grangemouth or, or somewhere else? Are we going to be doing the, the electrolyzing or the steam methane reforming onshore and then sending CO2 back out by the pipe? Or are we actually doing all the processing offshore, leaving the CO2 offshore and assuming carbon capture, obviously, for blue, and bringing hydrogen back via the pipeline? And for green uh, hydrogen production, are we actually talking about processing or producing hydrogen offshore and bring it by, by, back via by blended pipelines with blue hydrogen potentially or dedicated pipelines? Or are we going to be using a direct wire or some kind of power purchase agreement and just do the electrolysis on land? There's a few different scenarios and variables we need to think about, which will kind of govern how do we use the pipeline infrastructure. I think onshore is slightly different. Uh, onshore pipelines, uh, typically the feedback we're getting is they still need to be looked at, but it's a little bit easier perhaps to either cope them, run a pipe and pipe uh, type model or something else. But the reality is actually we, we, we can't take the risk of just replacing natural gas for 100 percent hydrogen. Uh, I think the, the biggest issue is the, the, the welds, the joints uh, of some of the sort of the, the pipeline network, which uh, are probably some of the, the biggest risk elements. But huge potential. We've got to find a solution. I think, yeah, looking at pipe, pipeline in pipelines, uh, yeah, pulling through is, a, is, is an opportunity we need to be looking at. But, uh, yeah, I should defer to others. I'm not so I'm not a structural uh, engineer on that basis, as you can probably tell from my response there, but it's, it's, an, it's, it's one that we need to get to grips with, but it's not going to be a single magic bullet, I'm afraid. Well, it was good to have an insight into your stream of consciousness there at the start there. It was uh, <laughs> massively <laughs> fascinating and confusing and all at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> no, it, but that highlights that highlights the exact point of where we are. Everything's an option, isn't it? Everything has to be, studied, has to be looked at. And, and I guess up when we, we look at the kind of Cromarty project and the, the opportunity that you talked about, Joanne, there is actually the grid network up there, but you are at the end of it. So I guess that represents two things, both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, what, what's your kind of thoughts on the, the possibility of hydrogen to gas networks and, and whether it's ready for it? I will also caveat this and say I'm not a, a gas engineer, but all I can tell you is from our experience and, and what we've been told, we've been working closely, obviously, with SGN. Um, we have been told that for our region, the infrastructure is capable of the 20% blending already without anybody having to change their boilers or their, their domestic infrastructure at this stage. There is also an ambition to move to the 100% hydrogen. I think if they don't, why do we need the gas grid in the future? In reality, you know, if we're not going to be using gas, what's it going to be used for? Um, I have also had somebody else speak to me about whether the train network could be used for transporting hydrogen across the UK. 
there is that an alternative to the gas network um, and I just wanted to pick up on one of Jonathan's points about the offshore production uh, so we're a little bit nervous and you may say we're biased because we're a port um, but our stakeholders are a little bit nervous about hydrogen production offshore because of the potential that that could then mean Scotland never sees any benefits at all you know hydrogens are produced offshore the tankers just come along pick up the hydrogen take it off to market and actually a lot of the jobs never actually happen onshore they're not they're not linked to the region where the resource is produced and i think we've seen so much of that in the highlands that there's a nervousness certainly in our region that we don't want to follow that model we think it's quite expensive as well obviously storing hydrogen offshore as well as producing it is a challenge it's, it's more challenging to do that on shore but that's why we've really focused on large scale electro uh, electrolysis onshore so that we get the jobs, we get the chance to have the business opportunities and develop the local content and hopefully obviously then export that technology and expertise around the world as others decarbonize and as others move into hydrogen. It's, we think there's a, there's a bigger play perhaps in Scotland in that regard. Okay. Could, I, could I just uh, comment on that as well? You know, the, the UK actually comparatively has a great gas network. You know, it's reaching more than 90% of the population. It's done a lot of investment in it because of the availability of North Sea gas and the attempts to decarbonize over the last uh, 30 years. You know, it's less than 50% in Germany versus uh, over 90% in the UK. It's also worth remembering, you know, you may have spotted from the accent, I'm from Northern Ireland originally, and I, I remember the gas network turning over, switching over from town gas gas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. In fact, Johnson Matthey was designing town gas manufacturing facilities to go into pipelines in the UK 100 years ago. So we're really a bit back to the future here and, and uh, should be confident that uh, over the last 100 years, we've learned how to deal with hydrogen in, uh, in pipelines. I think Looks we like might have been very speechless there. I think we've lost him. Oh, technical glitch. Shall we uh, carry on with the next question? I think Barry had highlighted, uh, wanted to talk about blue, green, and what about pink, uh, and the role of nuclear. Uh, and he's putting his notes here, he'll come to Simon first and then me. So Simon, blue, green, and what about pink? Um, all the colors of the rainbow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, look, so, I mean, as you put my gather from my presentation, I've been quite laser sort of laser focused on, on cost and, and pricing. And on, on the face of it, why go to nuclear? Because effectively with hydrogen, as we we're saying, like town gas, hydrogen is a manufactured gas. And that means that if you think about hydrogen for electrolysis, um, you know, we, we might well see uh, learning rates, you know, in electroly electrolyzers themselves, as Eugene indicated, come down, I expect, very sharply over the next 10 years. However, that's, not, that's only one element of your cost of production. You'll also need to, you know, look at the power source itself. Well, with renewables, yes, the cost of renewables has also seen remarkable learning rates, especially in solar but maybe more relevantly for the for the UK, uh, you know, in wind as well. Um, so, you know, you combine those two together, you're going to eventually see learning rates come down. But the problem is intermittency. Um, that the, the fact is that you can't, you don't get full load hours, you don't produce every hour of the year from, uh, from, from wind or solar. And that that slightly impacts the, uh, the uh, in economics of the integrated project. So the thing about nuclear, um, now, of course, nuclear does not have uh, learning rates which come down historically. Um, prices of, of, of nuclear have actually gone up. But if you just look at what you could do with existing nuclear, as, as EDF is doing and uh, thinking about in France, um, then you actually get rid of that, lo that intermittency problem. You can produce hydrogen uh, when you want it, and that does help your, your project economics substantially. Brilliant. Welcome back, Barry. Thank you very much for that. That was. Right. I was I was under extreme fear that somebody was going to ask me a question there. And I just thought, <laughs> I'll do the whole. Oh, my internet's broken. Your answer was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's the kids stealing your Wi-Fi, but you come to the office, it 
seems the Wi-Fi just goes on goes for a, a tea break at 11 a.m. So apologies for that. Uh, no, I'm talking about the colours of the colours of the, the rainbow in terms of, of hydrogen. And perfect. So I was going to just comment. I think the interesting the question that pink is is coming up more and more in discussions at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, up to probably about a month ago, obviously in from a UK context, we were only really talking about blue or green blue from fossil fuel and green from low carbon and renewables. Um, I think it's interesting when we start seeing we've got pink potentially from nuclear, yellow from solar, turquoise from, I think it's bioenergy or something something similar. Um, so I think depending on the technology, it seems that people are attaching different colors. That we just not, personally, I'd like to, I, I live in a world where I like to keep things simple. Let's have blue and green, I think that's fine. I think the reality is when we start talking about um, large-scale hydrogen hubs and, and the role of nuclear as well and, and uh, looking at continuous power that is enabled by nuclear versus some of the variability we have with some renewables. Without the battery storage component, we actually need both to actually look at yeah, those very points you were making, Simon, around continuous outputs, um, especially again, looking at efficiency. But I'm not sure why we need to start thinking about separating out because we might have a development where hydrogen actually has the benefit of renewables and nuclear and something else all kind of co-located. So we'd have a, what do we call that? Multicolored hydrogen of some, some description. So uh, I don't know what other, other, other panelists think, but I personal view, I just keep it simple, blue and green. Yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant debate to have. Uh, and actually you could spend the whole day just talking about the merits. And I guess the, the real tricky bit is when it comes to things like shaping government policy, funding mechanisms, that's when people start to naturally see some uh, some divergence or trying to split up funding pots and things like that. But it's a really, really exciting space to be in. I guess one one thing that I did manage to do when I was uh, leaving you all to chat amongst yourselves by the fireside, uh, catch up with some of the questions. Now, there's a fair few questions around uh, large scale transportation, distribution, and of course, ports are fundamental potentially to some of that. So if I can come probably again, if we start with a kind of large scale possibly technical challenges uh, and how that works from an industrial point of view. Eugene, if I come to you first, and then I'll come to Abigail, Jonathan, Joanne about the kind of port infrastructure and what that could mean for export. Eugene, any thoughts about large scale production, things like ammonia and yeah. methanol, what that means for the future of the, of the sector? So I think there are real big strategic questions about uh, how hydrogen will move about and how the energy and hydrogen will move about that will determine what get what gets built where and it's the wild west at the moment and uh, it's all out there to be fought for and whatever technologies can succeed will will uh, kind of drive things forward but for example if you think about blue hydrogen so think about where natural gas is at the world natural gas could for example come from the middle east as uh, as a liquefied natural gas it can get turned into blue hydrogen at a destination market like japan or the uk and then uh, you could take the carbon dioxide and sequester that carbon dioxide wherever you like. Alternative, in which case, in, in those instances, you're moving about carbon dioxide and liquefied natural gas, not moving hydrogen about. On the other hand, that hydrogen could be made in the Middle East and people could think about moving hydrogen about. So the economics of those different transportation uh, methods will be really key in deciding what infrastructure gets, uh, gets formed. Ammonia is, as you mentioned, another really interesting uh, area here because you can make uh, ammonia from green or blue hydrogen. And then you've got something that's much easier to transport. So uh, I think ammonia is, uh, you can transport at minus 33 degrees centigrade, unlike hydrogen, minus 253 degrees centigrade. It has the advantage that you can actually use it directly as a marine fuel where you can actually burn it in the same sort of engines that you burn residual fuel oil uh, in at the moment. That's much, it's it's uh, less of a hazardous material than moving hydrogen uh, about as well. I think as well, thinking about, I think that shipping application is going to be an enormous application in its own right. And what's certainly probably not going to be the case is that you get the whole world's port system working out, working out with different types of fuel. So I think that's a, that's a market that's going to slide in one direction or another and if it, if it all goes ammonia that'll be a huge application for uh, clean hydrogen to go into ammonia into ammonia production uh, i think the uk is very interesting the uh, position because uh, it's got the carbon sequestration it's got the offshore wind so it's got the ability to make blue and green 
And so uh, whichever way uh, the economics go, it, uh, it has, a, 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 has, has the potential to play in, in various ways that, the, uh, that, that these pieces on the chessboard could be put together and indeed to drive them. Yeah, and that and that kind of aligns very well with the obviously the, the ports and the kind of geographical mm -hmm. representations we have today. So if I can come to you first, Joanne, because you're already involved in a study, as you mentioned, with ERM and OGTC about what this could mean for bulk transport. What what's your views on the kind of the role of the port, uh, the opportunities, what you might have to do as a port for infrastructure investment, for example? Yeah, I I totally agree with everything that Eugene just just said um it's the vhs versus Betamax question at the moment um which which is going to win and um and you know when you're looking at investment in port infrastructure nothing in a port is cheap you know any development particularly involving water it, you're looking at millions of pounds so there's a lot of ports kind of watching and waiting i think to see what happens before they put the infrastructure in and there is that chicken and egg you know do we put the infrastructure in because that will facilitate the, the sectors changing and, and investing in, in new fuels or are you waiting for people to come forward and across with vessels, they don't replace their vessels very often. And, um, you know, most people are looking at at least 10 years for the most part, 20, 25, 30 years and um, before they're changing the vessels over. So we think shipping will be quite an interesting one. We're already seeing trials in the renewable sector, unsurprisingly of crew transfer vessels and, and other vessels that are already trialing hydrogen. We're seeing trials in the cruise industry as well, and particularly um, the German cruise industry, which is the, the biggest market in Europe for cruise. There is a, a step change already, but you know, I was on a, a podcast the other day on, uh, with the offshore renewable energy catapult, and some of the vessel owners were saying it feels like we're having to take all the risk at the moment because we're having to design vessels based on what we think is going to be the fuel of the future and to help the, their customers meet their decarbonisation targets but actually they don't know if that vessel is going to end up with the, the winning choice of fuel or not so I think a lot are looking at hybrid at the moment to try and accommodate that but again there's there's a cost implication so we think standardisation we need to be having those discussions on a on an international level so that we can all make sensible investments. Yeah, and and Abigail, from from Sussex's point of view, you mentioned that built actually down at Shoreham Port itself. Do you do you already kind of get a feel for what that kind of port infrastructure or port opportunities look like, either for export or use within the port, for example? Yeah, certainly. So we've. Um... At Shore and Port, we're already very keen on investigating the use of um, hydrogen um, generators for shore power, as um, that's that's a at the moment that's for most ports um, diesel generators are used to supply shore power to the to the vessels that are in the port. Um, so that's going to be a, a a kind of an immediate stepping stone to switching over to hydrogen. Um, and um, ammonia, I mean, ammonia seems to be, as, as um, we were saying, you know, it, it seems to be one of the areas that um, the sh shipping's most likely to go in. Um, I think the international maritime industry rank it as one of the leading choices for the decarbonisation of the shipping industry. And also um, ammonia is is one of the feedstocks we are uh, our partners at shore and port were pointing out that they they regularly um have ammonia passing through the port um and it's it, it's one of the essential feedstocks for fertilizers as well so they're they're seeing the feedstocks that pass through their for their port and um how they can be decarbonized themselves so um hydrogen has a huge potential once people start converting it to ammonia um in all sorts of uses so not just in in transport itself um but and going back to mentioning about um the potential for winds and tidal resources i think we have to remember that the uk has the largest winds and tidal resources in europe so um there's there's huge potential there for for green green hydrogen um yeah thanks for the, the yeah, I know that I know the guys up in Emek and Orkney will be screaming at the at the laptops just now about uh, their project, which again is a fast, fantastic example of 
how otherwise tidal energy might not have been producing electricity, absolutely mm -hmm. get it into green hydrogen production and use it thereafter. It's a perfect example. Ed, one, so a wee bit more kind of, uh, or kind of, we've only got a few minutes left. So one thing that we've not really talked about, but I wanted to kind of test your thoughts, Simon and Jonathan, about CCUS. So we know that obviously CCUS is going to have to perform the way that we, you know, everybody hopes it will. And it's got a right big kind of capital investment timelines. It's got its own challenges as a technology as well. Do you, I guess this is probably one of two forecasting space, Simon, do you think that that is one, going to happen? Uh, two, how much could that sway, you know, the either the attractiveness, either in scale or potential cost of blue? And also a very kind of, out there point, but I heard it the other day from one of my more insightful colleagues, which I thought was brilliant, uh, about the value of CCUS and in our race to net zero, and it is a race to zero, not almost zero, is CCUS going to be actually so valuable in the overall energy space that actually there could be better uses for it, other than trying to marry it up with, with a hydrogen to make it blue, for example. So actually, I just thought that was fascinating because you can see as we start to get towards 2040, 2050, people might actually start to really run out of things that they have zero zero emission alternatives of. And if you have green, you might argue, well, actually, CC, CCS technologies might be better used for another application. So any any thoughts at all, Simon, on how CCUS is factored into your, your analysis? Yeah, thanks, Barry. That's, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and it's really fundamental to other questions that we've had on the chat as well about does you know does blue hydrogen have a have a role you know could you get the return on investment before green takes over uh, and look i mean I, I believe that green will ultimately take over um we, we see the learning rates in the um technologies uh, and i think the argument for blue um certainly in the gas industry we've talked about being a bri bridge to the future for, for a very long time but but now I think that's really starting to happen. And I think this really is the bridge role because the bridge has an end to it. Um, and it's key, key to think about that. So I think in terms of CCUS, uh, it has been used in the oil and gas industry since the, uh, I believe the 1970s. I, I know there are only about 20 projects at commercial scale globally. There are also plenty of different C CCUS technologies. So some of them are more up the uh, sort of technologically developed than others. Um, but I think the technology effectively is is reasonably mature. And it, again, all of decarbonisation depends on uh, your local circumstances. And in the UK, we have fantastic resources in terms of uh, offshore uh, depleted fields where we can store um, st store carbon um, CO2 from, from blue, blue hydrogen projects. So, I, I mean, my uh, I, personal view is that blue hydrogen has a role in the uh, the next 10 to 20 years and that role is going to be making sure that we don't try and produce um, uh, upscale renewables too much to produce green hydrogen um, at some point we'll be able to scale to that point but effectively blue is that bridge before you you get to green and i do think that cc ccus um, costs are you know are, are manageable and the technology, I, I believe, is is at the point where we can we can rely on it. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. I know I know you've kind of got a mix of blue, green, and all the multitude of technologies mm. that you walked us through earlier. What what you what's your kind of sense from from hydrogen east about the role that it's going to play there? It's I think CCOS or just carbon capture is, is again it's it's almost the same uh, as, as as hydrogen that it's a very complex market right now, but depending on the infrastructure that we look at reusing or using for in some cases having to put in place to enable blue hydrogen, we've got to make a decision. Are we actually going to be looking at, have we got enough pipe work if we're depending on the options I kind of mentioned earlier, if we're doing offshore production, we need multiple pipes, one for hydrogen, one for CO2, depending on the blending and de-blending approach that you know, may or may not be viable. Um, I think CCUS now is, actually starting to happen because it's enabling another vector. It's enabling blue hydrogen. Before it was almost, how do we kind of look at a safe disposal of, of carbon through through previous uh, previous kind of uh, government funding uh, calls for, for CCS. Um, but I also think that you, we, we need to take a slightly wider perspective on CCUS than, than just blue hydrogen. That's really important 
but they're also direct air capture technologies that are being stimulated to look at the bigger picture of climate change. Now, if we're capturing CO2 through direct air capture, what are we doing with it? So at the moment, there is an assumption, can we store it or align it with storage uh, in you know, offshore reservoirs or offshore zones? Um, but also, I don't want people to forget, in 2018, there were major headlines globally around a shortage of CO2 for the drinks industries, pretty much. Uh, you know, 2019, around about this time, yeah, April 2019, there was another call in the media, are we going to repeat a global shortage of CO2? So I do think there is much more we need to do around finding alternative uses, of alternative markets. There's early stage research on synthetic fuels, so chemically blending hydrogen with CO2 to create synthetic fuels. Does that have a role to play, especially if it could be refined to E5 or E10 petroleum standards, to, could be a direct replacement for petrol, for legacy vehicles, then actually there's, there's different ways we need to look at it. As I say, it's complex, it's not as straightforward, but I think it's now going to happen finally because it's enabling a whole range of other technologies to come through, come through the market as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a tremendously complex area, but, you know, opportunities for everything, really. I think it's really important that we always round it back to decarbonisation. That's what it is. It's not it's not trying to pick a technology, build it and just sell it to anyone. And I used this phrase once before and I, I kind of regretted it, but it stuck in my head about running around with a hydrogen hammer looking for nails. And it's the same for every technology. You know, it's, that is not the answer. The answer is find the right use for it, find the right use case, the right customer. And we probably even haven't talked enough today about sectors, customers, end uses. Uh, you can very, you can bog down very quickly in terms of production, supply, and who wants to who wants to build these things. But it really has to come back to how much CO two are you saving and how cost effectively. So, so listen, uh, I know we're we're kind of a uh, pretty much uh, out of time. It's been an absolute brilliant, brilliant discussion. We've covered a lot of ground. To be fair. Uh, what I would ask basically is if everybody wants to have a, a final kind of context, you know, your reflections, not just on the on the chat, but where the where the sector's going uh, in the in the short, medium, long term. So we'll, we'll kind of take a minute each just to round off, and uh, we'll come right back to to you again, Eugene, to to kick us off. Well, I, I guess just building on the conversation we've just had, I'd reiterate the focus has to be stopping carbon dioxide getting into the atmosphere right here, right now. Of every 10 tons emitted today, two tons of it will still be in the atmosphere in a thousand years time. So it's important to compare the right things. If you're thinking about blue hydrogen, you need to compare your preference for blue hydrogen to your preference for continuing to burn fossil fuels. And then it becomes an easier comparison. You get that blue hydrogen and start decarbonizing cement and start decarbonizing uh, the steel, then green hydrogen becomes greener because you don't emit a lot of carbon dioxide whenever you're building out green hydrogen. So I think green hydrogen is going to be enormous. Let's not emit a stack of carbon dioxide between now and that kind of utopia in the future when we've got a uh, you know, hugely electrified uh, world with uh, endless quantities of cheap green hydrogen as well. It's the journey between now and then that we will decide how big the, the carbon dioxide balance is that we've built up in the environment that will cause us the problem. So pragmatic first steps on route to decarbonisation would be my mantra. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Uh, Joanne, I'll, I'll come to you for your, your kind of final thoughts and reflections. Yeah, just building on what Eugene was saying about that pragmatism, strategic uh, investment as well, you know, consciously deciding what are the best technologies to reach these decarbonisation obligations now. They're not targets, they're legal obligations that we have in our country to decarbonize. And I think you know, it's a hugely exciting space. And if we do this right, we can be creating technologies and expertise and hugely exciting careers for the next generation, You know, for people who can then take that knowledge around the world and help other people decarbonize. And in the year of COP26, when we're hosting COP26, what better legacy could we all leave to future generations than that? Yeah, brilliant. And we almost went a whole webinar without really talking about COP26, which is uh, unbelievable in its own right. Uh, but then COP26 won't go by without talking about hydrogen. So there you go. It's quid pro quo. Uh, Jonathan, uh, any any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, well, first, firstly, a, a thank you to both Scottish Power and the All Energy team for putting on putting this, this session. I, I found it, as even as panelists, really fascinating. Um, just, just, just talking and debating with with uh, fellow fellow members of the panel. I think the for me, this, this kind of under, underpins that 
underlines that this is a complex sector that we're trying to establish. Um, we've it's often been looked at certainly from a cost reduction perspective, similar to sectors such as offshore wind, which are around about twenty years old now. Um, similar technology journey. I actually think it's completely different economically, commercially though. So we're actually trying to create production technologies, potentially transport storage technologies, all the various potential use cases around transport, heat, re-electrification, vessels, re-engineering every type of vessel and vehicle, mm -hmm. as well as simultaneously trying to create the political, regulatory and fiscal framework that enables all of that. Um, so I don't, now tell me it's like offshore wind, but it's from a technology or cost reduction perspective, perhaps, but the rest of it is quite a challenge. Blue, green, pink, yellow, whatever colour, I think we're going to continue to have that debate for some time. That worries me in the sense that are we going to see regulation based on colour or origin of hydrogen, um, which we might need to think about. But otherwise, uh, just for me, it's just one of the most exciting areas uh, of potential for you know, to, to, to really address climate change at the local level. But for me, we've got to make sure that all the national infrastructure discussions are balanced with the local infrastructure discussions as well and creating the local markets that we connect the regional and local markets to create a national market so top down yes but we've got to have bottom ups and hopefully we'll meet in the middle yeah great point and uh, probably coming to you abigail that surely that kind of change with you the kind of regional approach the local benefits as well absolutely and um, well what was just interesting um it was just mentioned about how we have to re-engineer re everything and i was thinking well we don't need to re-engineer re everything from scratch and some of the really exciting projects that we're wo working on locally or working towards locally are on retrofits so um ricardo and brighton hope buses are looking into a joint project retrofitting existing buses so brighton hope buses have an extensive fleet of um euro 5 buses which will be um have their movement restricted with the new um, ultra low emission zone areas the, the queen clean air quality areas within within the cities and so they're looking at projects to retrofit those buses into hydrogen fuel cell which could then be rolled out across bus companies nationwide and internationally so things like that are brilliant um ricardo actually have just announced this morning that they're part of the cranfield aerospace solutions consortium who are working to develop a commercially viable retrofit powertrain solution for passenger carrying aircraft so again rather than going we need to work from you know we need to rebuild everything i think retrofit will be a really exciting stepping stone to move over to hydrogen and start to really um embed the hydrogen economy brilliant thank you and and simon uh, any kind of final thoughts on the overall perspective and the the you know the fairly rich discussion that we've had today yeah, look, absolutely. Um, I mean, just final kind of reiteration really is just to say that um, I think that at the moment hydrogen is, is a sector which is, is rightly getting a lot of uh, a lot of support um, uh, and offers very kind of rich rewards um, at the end of that. But at some point, that point, that support will start to, to ease off, and uh, and hydrogen will have to compete on cost. And we talked about manufactured gas, town gas earlier, which is the, the previous kind of manufactured gas we used. And by the 60s, that had only got to about a 6% uh, sort of penetration of, of the kind of UK energy markets. And it was really stuck in niches because it, it struggled to compete on cost against other fuels. Now, hydrogen will compete against electrification. It will keep, compete potentially just against uh, CCUS without, without hydrogen of fossil fuels directly. So I think we need really a lot of transparency around cost to give that, uh, to make that move from this market formation stage to the real diffusion stage. Yeah, no, listen, uh, the only thing really left to say is a massive thanks to everybody. So on, on behalf of the probably, I, su I suspect kind of getting towards kind of thousand live audience members, but also I'm sure it'll be downloaded and a reminder to the audience that uh, all the presentation slides are available online at, at some point, I'm sure, as well. And this this recording will be available for other people to look on uh, retrospectively. So really a massive thanks for all of you for, for coming along and contributing your thoughts. It just shows, you know, again, hype from reality that actually there are real projects out there. There are real challenges, of course, but this is just a tremendously exciting space to be. It's certainly from our point of view, selfishly, uh, hopefully you see a few announcements coming out from Scottish Power in the next week or two as well. Again, just to reinforce the fact that this is happening. It, it does feel like the start of something enormous, to be honest. So, listen, that's it. An absolute thanks. A well-earned coffee uh, and biscuit for everybody. 
on behalf of uh, Judith and all the team as well, thank you as well. And uh, thanks for all the audience for, for making time available this morning. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.